Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guy. It's a phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Hey, you know what? You want to hear something that we've never talked about before? Melissa's on the road. <laughs> on location in Northern yes. California. Yes, I am. <laughs> she couldn't wait to be part of this episode. She's on the road. She's helping out some family, but... Had to be here for Callous of October. Of course. (laughs) How could I miss this episode? Bull semen is a special interest of mine. (laughs) Uh, uh, I've studied it for years. (laughs) (laughs) This is, of course, season four, episode 12, titled The Callous of October. It originally premiered on February 5th, 1988. It is written by Ed Zuckerman, who uh, didn't write anything else for Vice, but did write a lot of stuff. For JAG, Star Trek The Next Generation, and Law and Order, including producing like 41 episodes of Law and Order. I like this really? guy. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, according to the rest of his work, he doesn't know how to have a good time. Unlike this episode. I can get down on some JAG like 4 o'clock in the morning. You know when it's on. <laughs> you just flip it over to Ion and there it is just waiting for you. Yep. <laughs> the director is Vern Gillum. He also directed Child's Play. Let that sink in for a minute. And then uh-huh. he's also got he's also got three more coming. So get used to Vern Gillum. Although I'm <laughs> pretty sure based on that name, it's a pseudonym. <laughs> <laughs> no one's taking credit for this week again? Okay. We're crediting out of the pseudonyms, guys. <laughs> Before we get started, can check in and see who's going to each other's lives. Guys, as I just mentioned, Melissa's on the road. That leaves me home all by myself to take care of the house. This is a very very dangerous position for me to be in especially being alone (laughs) and unsupervised (laughs) i'm picturing nachos three times a day (laughs) it's a no pants zone i have pictures of our toddler with no pants on where are her pants i don't know (laughs) the two things that i learned the fastest while being home alone one the dishes never end literally (laughs) they are they are bottomless they never end No matter what you do, they just magically appear. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Two, when things get quiet, you've finished all of your work, you're getting ready to sit down, that is right when something weird is about to happen. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Also true. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. (laughs) Something weird is going to happen, right? When you think things are at their calmest. But in reality, if I'm going to be totally serious, what it's like being home alone with me, it's actually more of an Uncle Buck kind of feel (laughs) the neighbors are nervous seeing me inside of the house i'm arguing with appliances making gigantic giant socks in the microwave (laughs) yeah (laughs) food and pickle jars and punching out clowns at the front door that's what it's like really (laughs) really it is (laughs) (laughs) get your mouse and i suggest buying some paper plates uh i can (laughs) tell you nothing feels better than after dinner not having any dishes so I was telling Melissa earlier that I've come up with a brilliant idea. And if we lived in the Bay Area, I could probably get VC funding and it'd be a millionaire. It's a dishes service. At the end of the day, you put all your dishes in a plastic tote. You put it outside your front door. That evening, someone will come pick up that tote and leave a tote of clean dishes at your house. Exactly. That's a wonderful idea. We need that at our house. <laughs> Pat pending. I, I don't think you would be able there. to put up with us at my house, though. Certain members of, of my house are very particular about the dishes and <laughs> insist on pre-washing the dishes before washing the dishes in the dishwasher. <laughs> I also know this person will lick a spoon and then stick it back in the mayonnaise. So I've seen it. <laughs> I saw it. Hey, it's a strange world. <laughs> Just think about that when you use your mayonnaise, John. You never know what's been licked and put back in there. Uh, <laughs> we've switched to a squeezable. Exactly. <laughs> That's why you have spray on butter too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Quit judging me. <laughs> well, speaking of weird and awkward, we have the cows of October to talk about. This one even starts off on a weird foot. So let's go talk about this week's episode. So when we open up, we got cows, lots and lots and lots of cows. This is Dallas, right? Yes, it is. Apparently it is with this (laughs) storyline. 
think their cow farms in Miami. Uh, yeah, good, good point, John. I want to know that too. Right by the beach or what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it's like they're staked out at a steak ranch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what are they even investigating? Are they investigating all the cow tipping complaints? <laughs> I know that's never really clear, is it? Like from the beginning, like what are they actually there for? Why were they actually there for real? Like what were those people doing? <laughs> this is so yeah. as as what I'm to gather here is that they actually set this up as the drop point for Roxy, that who's working with them is supposed to do a swap for twenty keys. So it's like there's someone on the inside, and this is where they selected to do the drop, and this is where Vice was going to then bust them. No, whatever. Either the cows. that, <laughs> either that, or this is the. This is the alternate ending to Porky's Revenge. <laughs> I wasn't sure if Izzy had something to do with it. Like, that's why they went to him immediately, because, like, he set it up or something. I don't know. Because he's that in would... his cowboy stage. So, you know, it <laughs> yeah. only yeah, makes exactly. sense. <laughs> that would make more sense on why Izzy's all into, into being a cowboy right now. He's like a village people. <laughs> <laughs> And then suddenly, Stampede. They're out to stump our claim. (laughs) (laughs) These dang cows are out of control. (laughs) What it ends up being is that it's the distraction so that the drug dealers can actually go and make the pickup while the vice team doesn't actually see it happen. That means that the person that they were trying to bust knew that that's what was happening here. They pull up and kind of say, hey, see you later, guys. And then they pull off. After the cows clear... They see this man just laying on the ground with this silver smoking canister laying next to him. So this is also to suggest that our cowboy in this episode that scams everyone was in on the scam on the drop in the very beginning of the episode. Yeah, I didn't think about that. He was, yeah, he was in on it, the whole thing. So you're telling me it's not a bomb. (laughs) (laughs) The vice team thinks it's a bomb and everyone scatters and there's just this silver canister and they leave Cowboy Bob there because we don't know his name yet, just lying on his back. And we go to the opening credits. At this point, I'm as confused as I think the vice team is. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what the hell's going on. There was a stampede. There was a 20 kilo drop. No one chases after the person that took the drugs. They're more worried about this passed out cowboy and his alien looking bomb (laughs) (laughs) so pals the last few weeks we've used this spot right after the opening credits to talk about our guest stars that have been in the episode because there's been so many of them but i think this is where it's going to be its permanent home is that we're just going to talk about the guest stars every week right here in this spot and this week we have a special one that's near and dear to my heart. First, let me talk about Garrett Graham, who plays Calvin Neal. He was in uh, movies like Used Cars and Child's Play 2. He also voiced Franklin Sherman in the TV show Cartoon The Critic. Oh, really? Oh, so he was the dad? That's yeah. Franklin, right? He also has the distinct honor of appearing in not just one Star Trek f- fr- Star Trek franchise. He appeared in an episode of Star Trek Voyager. He also appeared in Deep Space Nine in a Deep Space Nine episode as a different character. Obviously, that's weird that we also have someone who did a bunch of writing for the Next Generation on this episode too. Yeah, well, he took his hand. He he took his hand at writing uh, himself. He wrote two tel- teleplays for the Twilight Zone. Also appeared in an episode, but not none of the ones he wrote. Good old. Ca- Cowboy Cal also co-wrote a couple songs with Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead. (laughs) Well, that took a turn. (laughs) Uh The next guest stars Gino Silva, who plays Rojas, best known for playing the Skull, who is uh, Sosa's silent hitman in the movie Scarface. He also uh, appears in movies like uh, Jurassic Park's The Lost World, uh, Mulholland Drive, and A Man Apart. Although he's, I won't be honest, he's not in the biggest roles. So like in The Lost World, he plays the barge captain. In Mulholland Drive, he plays the hotel manager. But my two favorite roles that Gino Silva plays is El Coyote if, uh, on an episode of Walker's Texas, Texas Ranger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Rod, Rod Rodriguez in the movie My Mom's a Werewolf. <laughs> Classic movie that my mom's a werewolf. But the big guest star is Harry Shearer, 
who plays FBI agent Timothy Anderson. He's an actor, writer, comedian, radio host, director, and producer. Let's just start at the beginning. As a kid, he had a piano teacher who uh, turned child agent. She actually okay. got him a role on a radio show. Well, the piano teacher, her, her daughter was in a couple, like, TV shows or something. So she became an agent, and she asked Harry's parents if she could get him some roles. He got a role on the radio show, the Jack Benny program, which would be his first role. And then from there, he would meet Matt Blanc, who who Matt Blanc voiced uh, Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, and Barney Rubble. And he kind of took him under his wing, kind of got him started in screen acting, and basically got him into Hollywood. There is no one better in Hollywood to get connected with if you're going to do voice acting than Matt Blanc. Yeah, Lit- exactly. Li- so literally, it's if there was a Mount Rushmore of voice acting, he might be the only person on there. <laughs> Excuse uh-huh. me, Peter Cullen that- would be there too. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Don't you talk. <laughs> it, that would seriously pay off. But later on in his career, first screen acting debut would be in '53 in the Abbott and Costello Go to Mars. In '57. He would actually play a character who would later become Eddie Haskell uh, on the pilot episode of Leave It to Beaver. Wow. The only reason he did not go on to play Eddie Haskell in the series was his parents decided they did not want him to be a regular on the show, but only do occasional work. He actually took a break from acting completely. He attended UCLA on a poli science major. He did postgraduate work at Harvard. He worked in the state legislature of of Sacramento. He was a high school teacher for a while. And then from 69 to 1976, he was a member of the Credibility Gap, Gap, a comedy radio group. Mm. From there, he would work with Albert Brooks on his project Real Life. He would also be part of an unsuccessful pilot with Rob Reiner. So he's starting to rub elbows with some pretty big names. Yeah, especially in the late 70s, like the early 80s. Yeah, so in 79, he would become a writer and a cast member on SNL. It would only last a season as he would he would kind of go rough and he would leave his, along with most of the cast, I think the entire cast from that year. But he would go on to co-write, co-create, and co-star in This Is Spinal Tap. <laughs> wow. So then he would follow that up. Like, how, do you, how, how would you get bigger than Spinal Tap? I mean, he would follow that up by meeting a young animator named Matt Groening and would join him on The Simpsons voicing some very, very uh, popular characters. And he has voiced them for years. It sounds like he decided to take his career up to 11. Everyone else's goes to 10, but but his goes to 11. Yeah, so... <laughs> I'm going to name off a few characters he voices on The Simpsons and just, you know, let me know if you know any of these characters. Any of them stand out to you. He voices Principal Skinner, Kent Brockman, Mr. Burns, Wayland Smithers, Ed Flanders, Reverend Lovejoy, Dr. Hibbert, Lenny Leonard, Otto Mann, Rainier Wolfcastle, Scratchy, Kang, Dr. Marvin Monroe, and Judge Schneider. And then many others. Wow. Damn. So he's everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody except the Simpsons. <laughs> everybody except Hank Azaria, basically, yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah, saying like, between him and Hank Azaria, yeah. does anyone else actually do any work on the show? <laughs> I immediately so recognized the-, the name when it came up. And I knew that because being such a huge junkie of the Simpsons, I knew of him. But I didn't know that that's what his history was, though. Last little side note. Since 1983, he has hosted a public radio comedy music program called the show uh which is featured on npr oh cool too bad it's comedy music and i'll never listen to it (laughs) Uh (laughs) when we come back from the opening credits we're at the lab and the scientist is investigating with switech and tubs and she's like don't worry about this bomb um it's full of bull semen so you guys are good Um, I'm concerned about bull semen. What if I got on their hands? How is that good? <laughs> you can't get bull semen out of your clothes now. <laughs> and this is when Cowboy Bob decides to show back up, too. So Calvin comes running in. He's like, hey, give me back my bull semen. I came, I came all the way You from ruined Texas. my bull semen. You ruined my bull jizz. You defrosted my jizz. <laughs> He says, essentially, 
he paid a lot of money to have gargantuous semen, which is the name of the bowl, who had a giant dick. <laughs> Sorry. To, <laughs> that's I'm thinking why of he giant him... semen now. <laughs> Just giant <laughs> semen. <laughs> That's why he calls him Gargantua, because he had a big penis, and they had it come all the way from Belize, and he paid $100 a tank, but he got ripped off. And they also now they've also ruined his one good tank. Of giant semen. <laughs> yes. yes. You know, you can't do anything with bull semen once it gets up to room temperature. Um, it, it, it's very sensitive. Uh, so you know at the, for that highly lucrative bulges market <laughs> at the precinct the whole team i mean this is this this case requires the entire vice team they're meeting with and it's not, i at first thought it was the department of ag but it's actually the fbi fbi agent <laughs> timothy anderson <laughs> They have some yes. weird divisions in the FBI. <laughs> they have the penis whacker offer no, <laughs> division. <Yes. laughs> and the bull semen division. <laughs> what is going on in the FBI? First, <laughs> your taxpayer first, dollars at work. <laughs> first, there was the FBI penis crimes task force. Now there's the yes. bull semen theft investigation unit. <laughs> yes. Hmm. You think that could be just one unit, though, really? You know, can you consolidate and just make it one? You would think it can even be the same guy. <laughs> Maybe <Yeah>. it is. <laughs> the FBI wants the quote unquote animal husband equipment located. And Castillo says, well, they need someone local to help them out. So we've assigned you guys to this case. Why couldn't they let the local Miami PD handle the bull semen case and let Vice do Vice stuff? Hey, they are they can basically on semen. put bike cops on this and be cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not the part that of uh, the scene that I uh, that I focused on. I focused on what I learned about the lucrative bulges market. So apparently, <laughs> they don't like it. They don't like when you masturbate them, <laughs> and that is actually why they have sad eyes. <laughs> yeah yes i'm learning about bulls this is educational down on the farm cowboy tubs okay so let's stop oh my let's god just, let's just stop for a moment here they are investigating a bull semen problem in miami both switech and tubs go to set up a deal with the farm this farm to find out how they can get some really good bull semen. So they're definitely clear to them based on their conversation with the farmer that they don't know what the hell they're talking about, but they're dressed as farmers trying to convince them that they do. But Switech kind of looks like a birthday party entertainer and yes. Tubbs looks like he's a stripper that works for the Thunder <laughs> Down Under. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I thought he looked good. I was like, damn, Tubbs looks good as a cowboy. That's what I'm saying. It's like he looked good with yeah. his shirt unbuttoned. And yeah. like, bloody chunder, he's from the land down under. <laughs> <laughs> so as this guy spends the next 30 seconds trying to ruin Tubbs and Zwitek's lunch, you could feel this episode. Uh, this scene was going to end with one of them getting uh, up close and personal with one of those cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the farmer goes through very detailed on all the things you need to do to get a cow pregnant and all the things that you need to be careful of. And then they s show someone handing them a set of rubber gloves. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> At the precinct, Calvin is showing the ladies the picture of Gargantua. You know, the bull with the giant penis. I mean, they have to look at that uh -huh. penis. It's just huge. Look at it. <laughs> just look at it right there. <laughs> He's also explaining it drags that... across the ground. <laughs> <laughs> He's also explaining that Gargantua died because they had he broke his leg while having sex, and they had to sell him for meat. He's a true. He, uh... he fell in a hole. They said he stepped in a hole while doing no, it. No, no, no. Let, let's give this in context here. Sonny comes in, asks if that's a family photo. Then tells him to go beat off his bull. And then he gets all sad because his bull's dead. So he can't <laughs> masturbate it anymore, which apparently was his hobby. <laughs> Ladies, they think it's sweet. You know, he died for love. I just want to say I love Gargantua. He's this giant bull who has a giant penis and people buy his semen and he died while having sex. He is a true American hero and the representation of our country all boiled into one bull. <laughs> He's a bull legend. They talk about him. The other bulls do. All two feet of him. 
Yep. <laughs> And this is why they need the semen back too, because he's dead. So this is the last that they have. Sorry. Of can't get semen out of a dead bull. <laughs> just so you know, <laughs> we tried. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so now we go to a kids' party where Izzy happens to be set up demoing bull whips. Was that really a kids' party? Did I miss that? that was a kids' party? I don't know. I- I don't know if it's a kid's party or if he's just in the park selling whips and the kids all think they're think cool. Just, yeah, I think he's just in the park. I mean, $5 isn't bad for a whip. I mean, I might pay $5 for a whip. Just kind of random. <laughs> so Cowboy Tubbs, Cowboy Switek, and Cowboy Calvin show up and they want to talk to Izzy. They're telling Calvin he always knows everything that's happening on the underworld. Izzy, meanwhile, is working hard on a woman in the park and he's... He's got himself there. He's going to get her phone number. Stan butts in and he says, Man, can you give your number to Manny? Damn it. And you <laughs> see him. And I even I went back and looked at checked the second time. You see him walk by. You get a glimpse of the side of his face. <laughs> but, but no words. No words from Manny. And you never see him the rest of the episode. The mystery of Manny continues. Who are you, Manny? Who are you? <laughs> In a car parked away, there's someone named Rojas who's taking pictures of everybody, and he says that he found Calvin. Tubbs is asking Izzy, like, hey, do you know anything about bull semen? And Izzy's like, yeah. I mean, kind of everyone <laughs> knows about it. Izzy <laughs> knows about everything. Every kind of semen How do you he knows not about know? it. <laughs> How do you not know about the bull semen market? <laughs> a lot of money in bull semen futures. Now, credit here to Izzy. He doesn't want any part of this he wants out he just wants to get that girl's phone number he knows someone who's into quote cattle insubordination but he doesn't want anything to do with this case Switek threatens to call his parole officer and so he has to be a part of this investigation now well i think in that outfit he has to be a part of this investigation i mean it's going to go to waste (laughs) what he's wearing he doesn't investigate (laughs) i think he's the only one aware that's actually aware of the investigation I don't think Vice even knows what they're investigating. <laughs> so Izzy's able to successfully set up a willing semen exchange. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Isn't that like every sexual encounter? Above <laughs> 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 parties agree to exchange semen. <laughs> How bad he is. <laughs> it's a bust. Izzy brings Paco so they can do this exchange with Cowboy Switek. So I'm just going to refer to him from now on. Everyone immediately mm-hmm. pulls their guns, including the feds who come busting out with a bullhorn. Two men start shooting at the cops. He about trips. Did you see him trip? <laughs> <laughs> the two men jump into a boat, get away. Paco runs off with the seaman and his own. <laughs> In tow. No. <laughs> and they have nothing because of the bumbling feds in this case. Everyone jumped the gun too early. Also, why is Tubbs still dressed as a cowboy? He wasn't involved in the exchange. Because he looks hot and he knows it. <laughs> He's got to go around and wait for the ladies to notice him. He looks good. He, could, he should stay also, a cowboy for the rest of the time. <laughs> okay. So I've talked about how I don't think Vice Squad is giving 100% this episode. This is example one. Normally, in a Vice episode, this is when we would get a crazy boat chase or car chase. But no. No one chases anybody. Everyone just kind of stands around and stares <laughs> at each other. <laughs> this is what they get for not having Sonny on the scene. Yeah, I know. Sonny's like not in this episode that much at all. He's he's non-existent, which is okay because he's in, usually in every episode. <laughs> yeah, considering last week, it might take him a while to get back into the swing of things. True, very mm-hmm. true. At the last moment in this bust, this failed bust for bull semen, they walk over to a car and they see a cigar sitting on the hood of a car. And the feds like Rojas, that Cuban pig. It's a Monte Cristo. So apparently they know each other. I don't. I don't know. Like I don't know. They, that was that was a big leap. I think for me. <laughs> how do you not know who Rojas is? Rojas has been ruining families for years. <laughs> damn Cuban swine. <laughs> Why are the feds so, so in, invested in bull semen? <laughs> well, we're going to find out right now because over at the precinct, the Fed is explaining Rojas's Cuban intelligence and that Cuba wants to make mini cows because Gargantua isn't actually a giant bull. He's actually a mini bull and they can grow more of them 
per acre in one tenth the acreage, but still provide two thirds of milk. And now there's an arms race to see which country can produce mini cows the fastest, the U.S. or Cuba in the 80s, which isn't really a problem anymore. But anyways. So, but wait a minute. <laughs> so, so- he, he- He's a mini cow, but does he still have a huge penis? Or was that a lie too? <laughs> I need to Why know do you the think truth he about the ground. <laughs> There's a quick driving scene where Stan is talking to Calvin and Calvin whoa, whoa, saying, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! You are just going to run right past the best part of that scene when they turn on the the classified bull porn." <laughs> As a group watching bull porn, so I tech makes the joke about evaporated milk. <laughs> Trying to pretend that the that the vice team wasn't watching heifer porn in the precinct. <laughs> Miniature heifer porn. <laughs> Look, they're able to to have sex in one tenth the size, but still produce two thirds the sex. Is it one tenth of time? <laughs> That'd be impressive. <laughs> there is this really fast driving scene where Calvin is telling Switek about how much money there is in making mini cows, but they're on their way over to Izzy's. And it's still actually nice to see that Izzy's living in that crazy house that we've seen him in a couple times now with all the stuff written on the wall. And, and also now a, hey. a fake bull. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> hey, hey, Tom, would you like to invest in some cow chairs? <laughs> that's it's, cowboy uh, cowboy cow does a fantastic job getting people to invest in his cow jizz business yes because after izzy takes a ride on the fake cow and talks about the red river movie he takes eighty six thousand dollars from cowboy cow to ha- go buy his semen gargantuan <laughs> semen <laughs> i was like whoa the truth is it's not even cow semen at all <laughs> well i have a theory at the end of this but we'll come back to that <laughs> he wants them to go buy it from hermosa and is he just wants to know what's in it for him obviously is he's going to try and skim as much money off the top as he can outside as they go to leave stan is explaining that hey look in the criminal world don't ever do like eighty six thousand five hundred dollars they do nice round numbers like one hundred thousand not 86,000. And Cal says, I just don't have that much money. I brought 90,000 with me. I had to spend some money for the hotel and stuff. And Stan's like, look, I want to get into the mini cow porn business. Nothing would make me happier than to personally give you $13,500 to make it even $100,000 bid to buy back bull semen. That way I can also be an investment into your bull semen industry. Cal's like, I will give you 5% of TL Industries if you're willing to do that. Stan is a moron. Yes, he is. Yes. So I was trying to figure out if he was in on the scam. He made it seem like he understood that Izzy was going to scam him. So I was like, is he in on the scam or is he just an idiot? And then like the next few scenes is like, no, no, he's just an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't need this this episode to confirm that. To know that that's the case. <laughs> Back inside of Izzy's house, the Fed shows up and he wants to use Izzy to buy the bull semen too. And Izzy says he's already engaged. But the Fed says, well, I'll just make a quick call to INS and find out about your warrants in Puerto Rico. What Izzy doesn't want to be part of any of this stuff. And everyone keeps threatening him with stuff that he thought was in his past. His parole officer, INS those warrants for his arrest in puerto rico leave the man alone yes but notice the price continues to go up now it's two hundred thousand, maybe more (laughs) and then rojas calls and attempts to blackmail izzy over the warrants too and the fed apparently everyone got the memo they concoct a plan to have izzy sell different bull semen so they can bust rojas question mark i don't know (laughs) <laughs> and now we're up to $259,000. Inflation is a bitch. <laughs> At the Rojas meet, Izzy shows up. Tubbs and Dwight Tech are watching. And right when they go to do the exchange, someone shoots from the bushes. Rojas shoves Izzy into the car with another his goons that throws him into the car. And they drive away. Tubbs and, Tubbs and Dwight Tech come pulling up. And it was the Fed who shot. And he's very proud of himself to say that he sold Rojas bad semen. <laughs> Let's just break this scene down from the beginning. So first, you have Izzy walking down the alley, 
asking people, hey, are you Rojas? Are you Rojas? I've got some bowl semen. Anyone here named Rojas? He doesn't even know who Rojas is. And then Izzy gets kidnapped after the FBI guy shot at a wall. Like, what the hell was he even shooting at? What, was he trying to kill Rojas? Like, was that a, a failed attempt? But I don't know what, what he was trying to do. So, as Izzy is being kidnapped very sloppily, <laughs> the Vice Squad is sitting in the van and in their perspective car, respective cars watching this. They watch them speed off with Izzy. And everyone gets out and kind of uh, walks up to each other and kind of yells at each other. Like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and Izzy's gone. He has been kidnapped by Rojas. <laughs> we ain't chasing nothing this week. <laughs> evidence too that they don't really give a shit i mean they don't even care about izzy they just let him go <laughs> at is it just keeps getting worse for izzy too because at rojas's warehouse they have him strung up upside down and they want to know where the semen is i mean you know you just ask nicely you might be able to get some <laughs> the problem is is they gave him giant cow sperm <laughs> and it is very noticeably different than tiny cow sperm. See, tiny cow sperm is much smaller than giant cow sperm. It's about the size of a catfish. <laughs> I'm speculating. <laughs> oh my, that's a really weird form of measurement. You are three catfishes long. <laughs> <laughs> Rojas says that he knows Izzy committed crimes against the revolution in La Cubana. And that's when Izzy's like, all right, fine. It's Paco that has it. The cowboy bid $256,000. Rojas says he will outbid him at 100000 but the briefcase is rigged as a bomb to prevent Izzy from stealing it. Like that'll stop Izzy. All right, we're up to three hundred grand. Do I hear three fifty? dollars Going once. Precinct, Calvin. It comes in and he's got flowers for Gina and Trudy. They apparently went out and partied last night and had a great time. Sonny is very jealous. Married man, Sonny wife mm -hmm. on tour, Sonny. Cal jealous. Calvin's trying to get uh, trying to get them to come back out so he can show them his milking technique. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Tubbs is like, what are you, jealous? You know you're married, basically. He's like, oh, is that a little bit of jealousy creeping up? <laughs> Crockett's like, no, they're not falling for that. <laughs> Crockett, Crockett's so jealous that he actually goes and pulls the file himself. He doesn't make Trudy do it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a quick scene at Izzy's where he's trying to break into the case while Rojas is listening to him through a bug in the case. And the vice team is listening to the bug on the phone and the Fed is listening on a bug too. He is saying to Rojas that, uh, sorry, he's, I don't know who he's telling, but he's got an offer. No, he's I don't know what's Paco. going on. Yeah. He's I don't telling... know what's going on in this case at all. He's got three different wires. Everyone's angling for bowl juice. The <laughs> money keeps going up and somehow Izzy is stuck in the middle with a bomb. He's telling Paco. He got an offer for 275000 so he's planning on keeping twenty five off the top. And this is when we go to the single weirdest scene in all of Vice. I would say this is the weirdest scene even over Peanut Butter Aliens. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not possible. Izzy now has this exchange with Paco where he's going to give him $275,000 for a case of bull semen. Izzy is mm -hmm. standing in the middle of railroad tracks while we have some music from the good, the bad, and the ugly plane. He's got a cigar in his mouth. He's doing his best Clint Eastwood. He mm -hmm. starts signaling to the Fed and to Vice and to Rojas. I don't know who he's signaling to, but he's doing hand signals in every direction. Paco jumps out know. of the Paco jumps out of the bushes, takes the money, and just runs off with both the money and the semen, driving down the railroad tracks with a truck attached attached to the tracks. It's the Fed. He comes pulling up as Rojas does. The Fed gets out of his car and says, This is your fault. Fires first. He's the first one to shoot at Rojas. Rojas shoots back, short shootout. Rojas drives away, and the Fed just drives his truck down the railroad tracks as if he's going to chase him. But he's, you know, bound to being on <laughs> railroad tracks. He can't go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way before he gets to a left turn. Let's just say that. <laughs> then Tubbs' white tech pull up. 
They ask where the money is, and Izzy realizes that everything is gone, and Rojas thinks he double-crossed him, and that's it. I, I don't know what the hell happened in this scene, how everyone, no one chased each other to figure out, no one chased after Paco. And the vice team saw him take the semen. Izzy didn't see it happen. Yeah. I don't know who he's signaling to. And who was the fed going to chase after with a truck stuck on railroad tracks? What the hell is going on? That's all I kept asking throughout this whole scene. He's making, he's doing all these goofy signals. The guy ends up popping out of the bushes and runs away with the money and the semen. And instead of anybody chasing him, they watch this, the strangest sh- shootout. Like you said, in the history of Vice, where a guy with a railroad car <laughs> shoots at another guy in a, uh, in a regular car over a bull semen, and then they both <laughs> just drive off like it's just a regular day, like it's Tuesday. <laughs> and the Vice squad is as confused as I am, and everyone's just kind of standing around like, what the hell are we even doing? Are we seriously investigating bull semen? And what is actually the crime here other than firing at each other, which was instigated by the FBI? (laughs) The best part about all of this is that we find out at the end of the episode is that the mini bull doesn't exist. Rojas and the feds are shooting at each other for no reason. (laughs) (laughs) He's so disappointed there's no mini cow. (laughs) A little. I'm a little disappointed. (laughs) At the precinct, Sonny has found all the information on Cowboy Calvin. He's a fraud. He shook people out of money all over the place. He. This is just what he does. This is his MO. Stan is heartbroken. I'm out $13,000. I've been swindled. Gina is heartbroken for reasons we don't know, but we can all assume. Yep, she saw some semen. (laughs) (laughs) At Izzy's, Calvin shows up and he's had he's telling Izzy that he's had the original all along. He was just using Izzy to steal the money. And Izzy's pumped. He's like, that's fantastic. I'm so glad to meet another person who's just like me. I want in on this scam. <laughs> that was up to half a million bitches. <laughs> Izzy says, I know he's he's like, I know how to get this up. He settles down in front of his phone bank and starts the calls he calls the fed he calls rojas he starts them on a bidding war the bidding war starts going up then he flips the phones around and then cal and izzy can listen in on the phone calls at the same time it makes it all the way up to a million dollars which the fbi doesn't have that kind of money are you crazy they barely have a, <laughs> they barely have a budget for a bull se- semen task force <laughs> Calvin tells the feds that he's lost and he cuts the cord on the phone and s- sets up the meet with Rojas and Izzy's going to get 20%. But why do you cut the cord on the phone, man? Like, it's not even your phone. Izzy <laughs> just helped you out on that? And, like, you just cut the cord off his phone? Jumping to the exchange, at th- this point, it would seem to be a double cross or a triple cross. or I- I've lost count at how many times... <laughs> We've tried to cross each other throughout this episode. (laughs) A tugboat pulls out in front of Izzy's raft and they do a semen exchange (laughs) in canisters. (laughs) <laughs> no, that, that, my in my head every time I say that I picture people just shooting it at each other all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> they take the bottle at point, however you want to interpret that. They give him a different one. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sonny is watching from a bridge. He sees that the feds interject themselves and do an exchange. Izzy goes and meets with Rojas. The money semen exchange, legal money semen exchange, happens, and everything is good for Izzy. So now we're going to go to what is essentially the last scene of the episode. Izzy and Calvin Mm -hmm. are having a celebration with champagne. Izzy just wants his money. He's looking through all the briefcases and stuff. He's like, I'm just going to take my money. I'm going to leave. But Calvin says that he's going to cut him in on a deal that he has with the Saudis. He's got all the paperwork. It's worth a billion dollars at least he'll, he'll totally call you izzy but he's gotta go he's got got a uh a flight <laughs> to catch <laughs> he leaves the paperwork with izzy says you keep a watch on these that way you have the billion dollars wink uh-huh. but i'm gonna leave and i'll be in contact calvin goes to leave but sunny's waiting outside the door now and sunny Son- sunny has spent most of the episode just watching all this crap happen and not saying or doing a damn thing about it, but at least he's kind of figured out things. Yeah, he's figured out that cow is a scam, and that the cow isn't actually a full size cow; it's a mini cow. He can tell by the shadow that it's been doctored. <laughs> yeah, you know, the shadow of the penis. He can tell that it's been doctored. <laughs> 
It, it's it's all those photography classes he's been taking. <laughs> Calvin tries to explain that he hasn't anything illegal, that technically it's just been a legal money for semen exchange. <laughs> okay, I don't know if that's and, legal. And I can't <laughs> argue with him. <laughs> technically, I can't argue with him. I don't exactly know what the crime is that anyone's been investigating, if anyone's been investigating. All they're basing it off of is that the FBI said that this was a big deal, that they had to get the animal husbandry material back. That never actually existed because this bowl never no. existed. None of these containers con contain bowl semen. In fact, I'm starting to question no, no, whether no, or not no, this no, is no, how no, they no. transport stop, bowl semen. Stop, stop, stop. Right there. They have to contain semen of some <laughs> kind because <laughs> we started out the episode in the lab when we found out it wasn't a bomb but contained semen. <laughs> so semen was in these containers. Who or what semen was in these containers, we do not know. But I am pretty sure Cowboy Cal has been masturbating into these containers for a few months now. <laughs> Because that would be much easier than trying to acquire actual bull semen. <laughs> we started the episode in the lab. That's very true. That they, they concretely say, it's semen. I've seen it. <laughs> That's what it is. It's semen. <laughs> Sunny then believes Cal enough to say, you can leave, but you're not taking the money with you. Now, what was Sunny going to do with that money? If he wasn't going to arrest Cal, which in retrospect, what he should have done is arrest him, hold him for 24 hours, do their investigation. Even if he did nothing wrong, then let a judge and a lawyer decide that. But Sonny just decides on the spot, no, I'm going to let you go, but leave the money? What was he going to do with the money? I, I don't know. And as we've already kind of established, we're not exactly sure if a crime has been committed. I don't know what authority he would have to... Ha he would have to stop him from taking the money, but none of that really matters because uh, he hoodwinks both of them. Because why the hell would he have the money in in the hotel room? Yeah, exactly. I don't know what. That's what I'm saying. It's like I think Sonny has a moment. He's blinded by greed here, and he's actually going to keep that money. And then he let Calvin well, get away, he, and then say, "Well, he, Calvin got he away." He has with the been money. a little bit. He has been a little bit emasculated by his wife, uh, his <laughs> wife making so much more money than him. Maybe this is like him trying to be a contributor. I don't know, but he got hoodwinked good too. They can't even get to him at the airport. And Izzy says that his fight doesn't take off until seven. So you can't even, I don't know what, they just decide not to chase him again. Like, no, it's not worth it. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Have you been to the airport lately? Man, I hate going to the airport. <laughs> we leave off with Cowboy Cal talking to the person next to him on the plane about the futures of mini kangaroo <laughs> in an Australian accent. <laughs> And that is the end of this episode. I was surprised by this episode. I was, I knew it was Cal's October. I knew it was bull semen. This was an unexpected episode, though. We took some weird turns and um, we tried really hard to be funny. And I got more details on that. I'm sure John does too, with based on what we talked about in the pre show about what we think of this episode. But I think me and John are going to agree in this. That we're not going to say it's a bad episode. We're not going to say it's a good one. We're not going to say it's bad either because mm -hmm. we know what they were trying to do. Yeah, yeah. I I think my final thoughts are going to be mostly positive. The silence you hear there is Melissa just shaking her head. Yep. <laughs> I'm she, over here like, she's whatever. Walked away from, <laughs> she's walked away from the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get there, Let's go talk about the most interesting music segment we have ever had on this show. All right, John, I'm not going to give anything away, but this is probably the hardest you've ever had to work for a music segment. This is the most important music segment we've ever had. These are possibly the biggest rock stars you have <laughs> ever heard of. <laughs> No, 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 no. Vice wouldn't do that. There is definitely a theme here. Let's see if you guys can pick up the pick up on the theme of the episode. Because there's definitely an underlying theme. Our first <laughs> song is "Theme from Red River." <laughs> I love that theme is in the name. This is by Dimitri Tomkin, and he also does our second song in the episode, "Wagon Train." 
from Red River. <laughs> As you might have assessed, this has something to do with the movie Red River. Maybe it's the theme from Red River. <laughs> I am so excited for this music segment because I saw what was in here and I'm like, this is going to be great. This is this. John always has these big stars or something that ties back to David Bowie. Although if this has a freaking tie back to David Bowie, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm leaving this podcast. That's it. I'm <laughs> done. I'm out of here. <laughs> well, Dmitry Tukin is a Russian born American film composer, conductor. He was classically trained in St. Petersburg, Russia before the Bolshevik Revolution. He lived through the Bolshevik Revolution by supporting himself playing piano during silent films. In the early 1900s, this is pre-1920, you would go to see movie, but they didn't have what we like to call now in the future, talkies. <laughs> so he did that for a while, and then he would uh, move on. He would pass around Europe. He would move to Berlin and then Paris, where he would partner with a, uh, his roommate, Michael Carrington. He would actually start playing piano for money. So enough so that he would move to New York with, with Michael, and they would get a job with a ballet troupe. He would actually meet his wife, Albertina Rash. Mm. He would do that f with his wife for a while until, basically until the stock market crashed in uh, October 1929. Work got real slow, so him and his wife moved to Hollywood where she worked to supervise dance numbers in MGM films. So she was actually hired in showbiz. And then he actually started writing for mostly small parts for MGM, kind of through his wife. His first significant score was 1933's Alice in Wonderland. Up until that point, and even at, uh, shortly after, he mostly worked on smaller projects. And he was trying hard to become a con concert pianist. But a broken arm in 1937 fo forced him to focus more on composing. So he would get his first break working with director Frank Capra. Their first movie together would be Lost Horizon in 1937. He would work on other Capra projects, including Mr. Smith Goes to Washington in 1939, Mm. And It's a Wonderful Life in 1946. As we started to come into the 50s, in 52, he started to get into scoring westerns. And he scored a movie called High Noon, which uh, starred Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, who were you know huge actors at the time. And the studio actually saw it as a flat-out failure, and they didn't want to release it. So Tomkin bought the rights to the theme song, Don't Forsake Me, My Darling, a.k.a. The Ballad of High Noon. He would release the theme with singer Frankie Lane, and it would become an instant success. It would mm. be played on popular radio, and it would make be so successful that four years after it was released, the movie would be released with country western singer Tex Ritter singing the vocals. The movie would go on and get seven Academy Award nominations. It would win four Oscars, including two for Tompkins' score. Tompkins' score is largely credited for saving the movie. When you hear about music and what charted in the 50s, it's like, thank God the Beatles came in the early 60s. Like, music was in a bad place. We needed the Beatles oh, more yeah. than ever. <laughs> yeah, if you had an orchestra, you could score a hit. <laughs> He'd win two more Oscars for The High and the Mighty in 54 with John Wayne and old, The Old Man in the Sea in 58. And he would also compose for TV, including such memorable songs as 1959's Rawhide. <laughs> <laughs> That's Everyone famous. knows Rawhide. Which, which would be covered by the Blues Brothers in the scene where they're at the cowboy bar and they would actually make a joke about the composer being a ukrainian born jewish american now that <laughs> would go over the crowd's head i don't know just references references to old dimitri tomkin <laughs> um, so and he would also compose the song for the show gunslingers he would also make a few cameo ap uh, appearances, including attempting to help Jack Benny write a song on What's My Line, and being a contestant on Groucho Marx's uh, quiz show, You Bet Your Life. Unfortunately, Dimitri Tomkin would pass away in 1979 in London, but over his career, he would compose at one point during the 50s, uh, he would compose at a rate of one movie a month. Holy shit. Continue on the theme 
How about the theme from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly by <laughs> Enjo Morricone? Obviously, the theme being from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, the Western. He is an Italian composer, conductor, and trumpet player. Since 1946, he has composed over 500 scores for cinema and TV. <laughs> 70 of which are award-winning films, including Fistful of Dollars, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, Bugsy, In the Line of Fire, Bullworth, and most recently, The Hateful Eight. Not all Bull- award-winning. I was going to say, like, Bullworth? Soundtrack? <laughs> <laughs> Not all award-winning. No, 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 no. I wanted to throw in some recent stuff. So the beginning was the award-winning stuff. The end was uh, just, uh, hey, he's still relevant. <laughs> Morricone started playing the trumpet in jazz bands in the 1940s. He would become a studio arranger for RCA Victor and in 1955 began ghostwriting for film and theater. He also composed music for artists such as Paul Anka and Andrea Bonicelli. Mm. From 60 to 1975, he would do a Mostly westerns, obviously the good, the bad, and the ugly soundtrack, which would sell over 10 million records and was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame as one of the best-selling scores of all time. (laughs) He would also have the soundtrack for the movie The Mission in 1986 go gold. So even in 86, man. Wow. Still still making them charts. Uh, His album, Yo-Yo Ma Plays, Enjo Morricone lasted on the Billboard Top Classical Albums charts for 105 weeks. He's actually mixed up with some big name people. I mean, it's not the type of music that we listen to, but being linked up with Yo-Yo Ma and Andrea Botticelli, like, damn, he's actually, aside from doing scores, like he's mixed up with some big time people. He would do the official theme for the 1978 FIFA World Cup, but ultimately music has been touted as highly influential and has be, been reused in some pretty big TV series like The Sopranos, in films like Inglorious Bastards and the Django Unchained, and also in TV shows like The Simpsons. We've got another Damn. Simpsons tie in there. <laughs> so, and as of 2013, he has sold over 70 million records. Now, that is just astounding for a guy, a composer and a conductor, basically a guy with an orchestra selling 70 million records. Yeah. So that leads us to theme from the Magnificent Seven. Yeah, are, yeah. Have you guys picked up on the theme here? The theme from the Magnificent Seven by Elmer Bernstein. Elmer Bernstein is an American composer and conductor. Have you guys picked up on the theme? <laughs> His career spanned 50 years composing hundreds of film and TV scores, somewhere around like 200 or just over 200. His works include Magnificent Seven, The Ten Commandments, The Great Escape, To Kill a Mockingbird, Ghostbusters, Airplane, Cape Fear, Animal House, which actually revived his career and got him doing comedies. He did most of uh, John Landis's films after that. And it just goes on and on. Uh, he won an Oscar for the score to Thoroughly Modern Millie in 1967. Whatever the hell that is. <laughs> He's actually nominated for 14 Oscars over the years. He actually was used to compose some of the fanfare for a lot of the National Geographic TV specials. His themes were also commonly used in Marlboro cigarette commercials. And in 1961, he co-founded Ava Record in L.A. with actor Fred Astaire, Jackie Mills, and Tommy Wolf. Damn, that's what's been crazy in this music segment is that this music wasn't just selected because of the movies it was in. It's also like some really accomplished people. Yeah, so I think what the disconnect, I think, for a lot of us is that nowadays most TV and movie scores are popular music. Whereas, I mean, up until the 1980s, every TV show and film was scored with either an orchestra or a jazz band. Like, there was a full, you know, 50-piece band putting together music and doing all the sound cutaways behind in every TV show. So aside from having a record label with some very famous people, one of Bernstein's songs is actually also famous, the University of South Carolina's fight song, when in 1968, Paul Dietzel wrote new lyrics, Step to the Rear, becoming 
The fighting game box lead the way. <laughs> On a side note, University of S- South Carolina is one of my favorite mascots <laughs> being the Gamecock. <laughs> I want to end this segment with something else. Elmer Bernstein, he was in that era with both of the other composers that I talked about. And I think something that gets forgotten in that era is that in the 1950s, they were basically hunting communists in Hollywood. Bernstein in the 1950s actually was called in front of of what was called the House of Un-American Authorities Committee for music reviews that he was accused of writing for what they referred to as a commie newspaper. It actually damaged his image uh, immediately after that, and it left him working on scores for films like Robot Monster and Cat Women of the Moon until eventually... <laughs> He would do the score for Animal House and get back into doing comedies and kind of revive his career. Well, John, of course, the music segment is never what you think it's going to be. And when I hear composers for Hollywood Westerns, this is not the direction I thought we would go. Although maybe the House of Un-American Activities might be. Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode because I think there's some strong ones here. Let's go give our final thoughts. All right, Melissa, as I think you're going to have a different opinion than me and John. Why don't you start us off this week? It's just too silly. I don't care about bull semen, okay? It's too silly. <laughs> I was very disappointed. There was no bull semen anyway. No, I'm just <laughs> I mean, the highlight was definitely... <laughs> there was. Technically, but. we don't know if it was human or bull semen. We're not sure. I don't think the lab got that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just. I mean, I, like I said, I'm disappointed. There was. We don't get the answer to that. But I was very excited to see Tubbs as a cowboy. I'm always on board for Tubbs in a costume. <laughs> I think he should be a construction worker next week. I'll go for that. Um, <laughs> it's very silly. I, it's okay. I mean, it's it's silly. It was a little bit too silly, and I'm I'm not in for that <laughs> hijinks that goes on. <laughs> I, apparently, apparently, I'm not in, into uh, bull semen enough to appreciate the episode. So you know. <laughs> John, we were talking in the pre-show and you hit the nail on the head about this episode because I think it's Vice trying to compensate for them, for everyone saying that season three was too serious. It really felt like one of the goofy episodes in the past. And what I was pointing out that it wasn't bad in the sense the meat fondler episode or truly with the UFOs where it was the writing was bad. Everything was bad. It was so bad that it was good almost <laughs> to a, in a funny way. This was like corny bat in like season two vice goofy they had that episode that was just kind of goofy and silly it made me think of the episode one where tommy chong guest appeared they were in the uh airplane boneyard just kind of a a general vice silliness break up the seriousness of penises getting cut off and (laughs) and marriage (laughs) and the correlations between the two (laughs) yeah i you know i i'm with you I think that this was purposefully supposed to be over the top and funny, and they were trying really hard to make it be that. They just weren't able to execute it on at every moment, but it was funny. And I think that the cowboy stuff was on purpose to poke on at Dallas too, like bull semen and and business con artist that was from Texas. You know, I think it was a cut at Dallas too in primetime TV and stuff. So it's you know it was fun. It was fun to watch it on the first time through. Like, it's still bad. It's still a bad episode. Yeah. <laughs> it's an episode you don't take very seriously. You just kind of laugh at the bull semen and the jokes. Even the Vice Squad didn't take it seriously this week. Like, they weren't trying their hardest to solve whatever imaginary crime we were trying to chase. Whatever was going on. I just want to know what Sonny was planning on doing with that money and why he was thinking that he was going to keep it all to himself unless he was planning on actually cutting Izzy in. And then it just leaves me at the end of this episode just feeling really bad for Izzy. That everyone yeah, always <laughs> takes advantage of him and, and they blackmailed him mm-hmm. into being a part of this. And so it just left, you know, kind of feeling bad for Izzy. He'll get his someday. You know what I mean? It'll work out for him. I feel kind of bad for Stan, too. He's out 13 grand, and it's not his (laughs) fault he's dumb. 
Well, it kind of is. <laughs> he doesn't have anyone looking out for him anymore. That he's he's alone in the van practicing magic these days. He's not that bright. <laughs> you know. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways that you can contact us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us on all of those social networks. You can get us on email. You can get us on that website. We would love to hear from you. Be sure to check out that website and find all the ways that you can subscribe to, including Stitcher, Anchor FM, Traditional RSS, links for everything, wherever you'd want to listen to this podcast of your favorite show, Miami Vice. That is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We'd love your support and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals. Bye.